Lee then withdrew, and the Second Corps continued to advance, and deployed in front of Field's entrenchments, and the Sixth Corps also deployed, on the right of the Second, ready to assault. At the critical moment when this assault was about to begin, it was suspended by the opportune arrival on the ground of Meade. Meade had read Lee's letter to Grant of that morning, and he took the responsibility of sending Lee a letter granting a truce of one hour in view of the negotiations for a surrender. This letter was delivered at Field's lines, and, Humphreys says, was received by Lee between eleven and twelve o'clock. This truce may have been prolonged, for it must have been as late as 1 p.m. before the message sent by Babcock from the front, to be presently told of, could have been started. Meanwhile, during the morning, and before the first flag of truce was sent, Longstreet had directed me to form a line of battle on which all of our available force could be rallied for a last stand. I got up all the organised infantry and artillery in the column and took up a fairly good position behind the north fork of the Appomattox River. To our left, the enemy was still extending his lines, and some of my battery commanders were anxious to expend on them some of the ammunition they had hauled so far, for the firing had not yet ceased. But I knew that Lee would not approve an unnecessary shot, and not one was fired from our line. When the truce in our rear was for the time arranged, Lee returned to our front and stopped in an apple orchard a hundred yards or so in advance of our line, where I had some fence rails piled under a tree to make him a seat. Here Longstreet joined him, and they again discussed the chances of Grant's making some humiliating demands. Humphreys's refusal to recognise Lee's presence between the lines as constituting a truce, while awaiting the reply to Lee's proposal to surrender on Grant's terms, and the reluctantly allowed single hour of truce as the alternative of instant battle, naturally made them, perhaps, suspicious. Few in either army yet knew of the liberality with which Grant was prepared to treat us. The general temper had been illustrated in the fight at Sailor's Creek by the Chaffin's Bluff Battalion, under Stiles, who tried to insist upon fighting to the last ditch. Even Lee and Longstreet, under the present circumstances, could not feel confidence in their hope that he might not demand unconditional surrender. So as they sat together under the apple tree, awaiting the coming of Grant's messenger to summon Lee to the conference, silence gradually fell between them. The conversation dropped to broken sentences, and there were occasional long silences between them. The last thing said was by Longstreet to Lee, as Grant's messenger was seen approaching. It was, General, unless he offers us honourable terms, come back and let us fight it out. Grant's messenger was Coulter Babcock of his staff, who had ridden ahead for eight miles with the reply to Lee's last note. Less formal than the previous correspondence had been, and using for the first time the customary terms of courtesy, it conveyed assurance that no unpleasant surprises were to be expected. It read, April 9, 1865. Gen. R. E. Lee, Commanding CSA. Your note of this date is but this moment, 11.50 a.m., received. In consequence of my having passed from the Richmond and Lynchburg Road to the Farmville and Lynchburg Road, I am at this writing about four miles west of Walker's Church and will push forward for the purpose of meeting you. Notice sent to me on this road where you wish the interview to take place will meet me. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, U.S. Grant Letters Genet. After reading this note, Lee said that he would ride forward to meet Gentra Grant, but that he was apprehensive lest hostilities might begin in the rear on the termination of Meade's truce. Babcock accordingly wrote requesting Meade to maintain the truce until orders from Grant could be received. To save time, this was taken at once through our lines by Col Forsyth of Sheridan's staff, who was accompanied by Col Taylor, Lee's adjutant. The meeting, by strange coincidence, took place in the house of Madge. Wilma McLean, who had owned the farm on Bull Run on which had occurred the first collision between the two armies at Blackburn's Ford on July 18th, 1861, and who also owned the farm and house used for similar purposes today, as told in the account of that battle. Lee was accompanied to the meeting only by Colin Marshall, his military secretary, and a single courier, 
who held their horses during the two or three hours consumed. A quiet dignity characterised Lee's bearing throughout the scene, and on the part of all Federal officers present there was an evident desire to show only the friendliest feelings. The formal proceedings were limited to an exchange of notes, Grant's note being as follows. Appomattox C.H. Var, April 9, 1865. General, in accordance with the substance of my letter to you of the 8th instant, I propose to receive the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia on the following terms, to wit, rolls of all officers and men to be made in duplicate, one copy to be given to an officer to be designated by me, the other to be retained by such officer or officers as you may designate. The officers to give their individual paroles not to take up arms against the government of the United States until properly exchanged, and each company or regimental commander sign a like parole for the men of their commands. The arms, artillery and public property to be parked and stacked and turned over to the officers appointed by me to receive them. This will not embrace the side arms of the officers nor the private horses or baggage. This done, each officer and man will be allowed to return to his home, not to be disturbed by United States authority so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside. U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General Gen R. E. Lee. This was accepted by Lee in the following note. Headquarters Army of Northern VA, April 9th, 1865. General. I received your note of this date containing the terms of the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, as proposed by you. As they are substantially the same as those expressed in your letter of the 8th, they are accepted. I will proceed to designate the proper officers to carry the stipulation into effect. R. E. Lee, Gen. L. T. Gen. U. S. Grant. Some conversation had accompanied the preparation of the letters in which Lee had explained that our cavalry had been required to furnish their own horses, and it was very desirable that they might be allowed to retain them, that the men might plant crops for the summer. Having been in public service, they were legally captured property, but Grant cordially yielded the title, not making it part of his terms, but instructions were given all quartermasters to allow all claims of horses as private property without question. General Lee expressed much pleasure at this concession, saying to Grant, This will have the best possible effect. It will be very gratifying and will do much toward the conciliation of our people. Grant's commissary was also ordered to immediately deliver to Lee 25,000 rations. The conference then terminated, and Lee rode back to his camp. As he was seen approaching, the artillery commands were formed by the roadside with instructions to uncover in silence as he passed. But the line of battle which had been maintained all day, seeing the movement of the cannoneers, broke their ranks and overwhelmed all with a great crowd, wrought to a high pitch of emotional affection for its beloved leader of the cause now forever lost. With alternate cheers and tears, they flocked around him so that his progress was obstructed, and he presently stopped and made a few remarks to the men, after which he was allowed to pass on to his camp. He told the men that in making the surrender he had made the best terms possible for them, and advised all to go to their homes, plant crops, repair the ravages of the war, and show themselves as good citizens as they had been good soldiers. This was but the second address which he ever made. On his way to Richmond at the beginning of the war, as his train passed Gordonsville, he was called upon for a speech and responded briefly, advising his hearers not to lounge about stations, but to be putting their affairs in order for a long and bloody war, which was sure to strain all their resources to support it. The firing of salutes was soon begun in the federal camps and the playing of bands, but Grant requested that all such demonstrations be suppressed, which was quickly done. Without any further mention of the subject, it was assumed as a matter of course by Grant that our paroles would protect everyone who surrendered from political prosecutions, and he had it so arranged that each one was furnished with an official copy of Jenner Orders No. 43, issued from the headquarters of the 24th Corps, which had a printing press along. It read as follows. By agreement between the officers appointed by Generals Lee and Grant to carry out the stipulations of the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, 
The evidence that an officer or enlisted man is a paroled prisoner of war is the fact of his possessing a printed certificate, certifying to the fact dated at Appomattox C.H. April 10th, 1865, and signed by his commanding officer or the staff officer of the same. All guards, patrols, officers and soldiers of the United States forces will respect such certificates, allow free passage to the holders thereof, and observe in good faith the provisions of the surrender. That the holders shall remain unmolested in every respect. After the assassination of Lincoln, there came a wave of bloodthirsty resentment over the administration, which found victims both among the innocent and the guilty. Powerful influences sought to involve Lee and others among his officers in the destruction they planned. They sought to read into the terms given by Grant a single word, military, that the immunity promised might read that paroled prisoners should not be disturbed by US military authority, so long as they obeyed the laws in force where they resided. Then they hoped that the hanging might begin. General Lee was already indicted for treason by a grand jury summoned in Norfolk early in June 1865. Grant immediately notified President Johnson that no man protected by his parole could be interfered with, and this effectually stopped all such proceedings. The report of our ordnance officers on the morning of the 9th had shown only 70 92 organised infantry with 75 rounds of ammunition and 63 guns with an average of 93 rounds. The infantry were directed to march out and stack their arms and retire. The federal officers then took possession. I was directed to form all the guns and caissons in single column along the road, that the federal officers might then conduct it to their camps. The artillery horses had already been out of rations for some days. The federal officers had reported their own supplies of forage exhausted. With a heart full of sympathy for the poor brutes, I formed the column on Tuesday, April 11th, and left them standing in the road, which they filled for about a mile. The next morning I bade goodbye to Appomattox, and as I rode off from the scene, I saw the mournful column of artillery still standing in the road unattended, but with many of its poor horses now down in the mud and unable to move. Grant had left Appomattox on the 10th, after a call of courtesy on Jen and Lee, in which he had suggested that Lee might serve the cause of peace by a visit to N.C., where he might see President Davis and Jen and Johnston. But Lee felt that the surrender had made him but a private citizen and without authority, and he naturally avoided even the appearance of wishing to interfere, and declined to go. At that time Brazil was going to war with Paraguay, and, fearing that I might find difficulty in getting employment as a civilian and being already so far on my way, I determined, before returning to Gay, to go to Washington, D.C., and interview the Brazilian minister as to the chances of a position in the Brazilian army. So, from Appomattox, I started on April 12th for Washington, sending my horses to Gay, by friends, and joining a mixed party of Federals and Confederates riding to Burksville, where we could take a train. The party had an escort of cavalry, and included Honon E. B. Washburn of Ill, well known as the special friend of Jenner de Grant, and Confederate Majin Gendener Wilcox of Ayla. In the course of the ride, Wilcox and I had a conversation with Mr. Washburn, which impressed us both deeply at the time, and which I am sure I can even now repeat without material variation. In common with all of Grant's army, the officers and soldiers of our escort and company treated the paroled Confederates with a marked kindness which indicated a universal desire to replace our former hostility with special friendship. All Federal privates would salute our uniforms, horsemen and teamsters would give us the roads, and in all conversations with officers or men, special care would be evident to avoid painful topics. At one time, when the three mentioned were riding together, Mr. Washburn asked us, What, in your opinion, will now be the course of your other armies? Will they seek to prolong the war, or will the surrender of Lee be accepted as ending it? We both answered that we had no doubt of the latter course being followed by the remaining armies, nearly as fast as the news could reach them, and we then said to him, 
The question will not be what are we going to do, Mr. Washburn, but what is Mr. Lincoln going to do? Well, gentlemen, said he, let me tell you something. When the news came that Richmond had fallen and that Grant's army was in a position to intercept Lee's retreat, I went up to the White House to congratulate Mr. Lincoln, and I had the opportunity to have a talk with him on this very topic. Of course, it would not be proper for me to violate Mr. Lincoln's confidence by disclosing any details of his plans for restoring the Union, but I am going to make you a prophecy. His plan will not only astonish the South, but it will astonish Europe and foreign nations as well, and I will make you a prediction. Within a year, Mr. Lincoln will be as popular with you of the South as he is now with the North. As soon as we were alone together, we compared notes as to what Washburn could have meant. In view of our poverty, it could only have meant that in some way the South would receive money. In view of the lack of any other plausible excuse for paying it to us, and of the arguments used by him at the Fortress Monroe Conference why the South should be compensated for the emancipation of the Negro, I have ever since felt convinced that Lincoln, in that interview with Washburn, recurred to his well-known wish to do that act of justice to the South, and that Washburn believed that he would now be able to accomplish it with the prestige which success in the war would bring, and with the spread of the good feeling already inspired in the army by Grant's act of generosity. Unfortunately, and without fault of her own, the work of an assassin only three days later changed everything, converting into gall the very milk of human kindness in every breast, and blasting the South with a whirlwind of resentment, the effects of which will not disappear for generations. But one of its first effects was one for which I will ever remain grateful. It made it utterly impossible for me to go to Brazil. I called on the Brazilian minister in Washington on the 18th, while the President's body was lying in state in the White House, and the streets swarmed with angry crowds ready to mob anyone known to be a Confederate. His Excellency kindly advised me to give up all ideas of Brazil, and to take myself out of Washington City with the least possible delay. This I was fortunately able to do, with one narrow escape from a detective who saw something suspicious in my $500 Confederate boots and blue soldier's overcoat dyed black but I was able to elude him and take a train to New York whence I sailed to Port Royal, S.C. Thence, via Savannah and through the country ravaged by Sherman, with many delays and difficulties, I made my way to my boyhood's home at Washington Gay, where my wife and family were. This place was now on the only route of travel possible between the eastern states of the Confederacy and the Gulf states. Through it passed not only President Davis with his family, but the whole Confederate government, which here disbanded, and beyond this point became fugitives, and also the entire debris of all the eastern armies whose homes lay west of the Savannah River. I, therefore, anticipated that I would here meet Mr Davis, and would be able to give him more news than had reached him by the land route he had travelled, on which there were but few and disjointed pieces of railroad in operation, and no through telegraph lines nor mail service. So not only was I full to overflowing with important information, but in my talk with Jen and Lee on the morning of the surrender I had gotten to appreciate the spirit of dignified submission in which he was meeting what had befallen him and was advising the same course to all. As I recalled what he had said about my proposition to disperse the army in the woods and bushes, that the only dignified course open to him would be to go and surrender himself to General Grant and take the consequences of his actions. I felt a passionate longing to repeat that conversation to Mr Davis, and to beg him to take advantage of the opportunity opened to him by the government's offer of a reward of $100,000 for his capture as concerned in the assassination of Lincoln. It seemed to me to offer the only dignified escape from his perilous and impossible position as a fugitive, that, with the example of Lee's approval of such a course before him, he would welcome the opportunity to go to the nearest federal officer and surrender himself and demand a trial on the charge of complicity in the assassination. But it was not to be. I am not sure whether or not the news of the rewards being offered for his apprehension ever reached Mr Davis before his capture on May 10th in southwestern Gay. I had lost 24 hours in leaving Savannah by my horse shying at a dead mule by the roadside and breaking my buggy 
and that loss brought me to Washington Gay on May 5th. Mr. Davis had left Washington on May 4th with a small escort of friends, planning to make his way across the Mississippi and to carry on the war with forces to be raised there. It was the disappointment of my life, even though in later years and after the death of Mr. Davis, Mrs. Davis has assured me that nothing could have ever induced him to thus abandon the cause of the Confederacy. But he would have seen before him the parting of the ways, and down the road of dignified submission even to injustice, wrong and robbery as we still conceive it, he would have seen the figure of Lee preceding him and calling upon all to follow. Who knows but what he might have been moved to do so. The Federal casualties in the closing operations from March 29th to April 9th are shown in the following table. The Confederate casualties, of course, can never be accurately known. In killed and wounded they were probably about the same as the Federal losses, but the captured or missing would be much greater. The following table gives the total numbers of officers and enlisted men paroled on April 9th. Jennard Humphreys states that of the troops surrendered only about 8,000 had arms. The miscellaneous detachments included the remnants of the naval and heavy artillery battalions, provost guards, departmental employees and some odds and ends of troops. I cannot bring my narrative to a close without a brief summary of the record made by the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia in the two years, nine months and nine days, during which it was under the command of Jenner Robert E. Lee from June 1, 1862 to April 9, 1865. In this brief period of a thousand days, with inferior numbers, poorly equipped and but badly supplied with food and clothing, it fought seven great campaigns against six picked generals of the enemy. This last campaign endured for eleven months, during which the guns were scarcely silent a single day. Lee's army at its greatest numbered less than 85,000 men. It put hors de combat more than 262,000 Federals within the period mentioned. The following figures are from the official archives in the War Record Office in Washington, showing the Federal numbers killed, wounded and missing in each campaign, with a deduction of 2,000 from the first for the casualties occurring before June 1, 1862. These figures include nothing for Longstreet's Corps at Chickamauga and Knoxville, it having been detached from Lee from Sceptre 1, 1863, to April 30, 1864. They would add many thousands to this list of casualties, could they be included. Briefly, it may be said that Lee, in a fight to a finish against heavy odds, prolonged the struggle for a thousand days, and put out of action, in the meantime, more than three of the enemy for every man in his own army at its maximum of strength. Scarcely in the history of Napoleon's twenty years in power can the record of such fighting as this be paralleled. The number of the enemy placed hors de combat in the Grant campaign alone is said to double the losses inflicted upon his opponents by the Duke of Wellington in all his battles in India, Spain and at Waterloo. No modern European war has approached this for carnage. Even in the recent conflict between Russia and Japan, where the armies were of immense size and the weapons of peculiar power, one is almost amazed after reading the popular accounts to find the killed and wounded among the Japanese in the siege of Port Arthur, largely exceeded by those of Grant in his last campaign. Bravery in battle is the religion of Japan, and the whole nation is a religious unit, it is encouraging to realise that the loyalty to his flag and country of the Anglo-Saxon has shown itself capable of enduring equal tests of devotion. It would be strange indeed if in critically reviewing the details of Lee's rapidly conducted campaigns we found no instances of grave errors of judgement when brought to the test of being viewed in retrospect. We do find them, and have not hesitated to note and to criticise them as frankly and freely as he himself would have done had he lived to write his own memoirs. No more intimate idea can be gained of his personal character than can be had from the study of his attitude upon such occasions. Knowing how quickly and clearly he must have recognised mistakes after making them, and how keenly he must have felt them, one can appreciate the greatness of mind with which he always assumed the entire responsibility, either frankly saying to his men, as at Gettysburg, it is all my fault, 
or as at the crossing of the James, passing over whatever had happened in silence, without any attempt to impute blame elsewhere, or any apology, excuse, or even a spoken regret. This was equally the case when the fault was altogether that of others, as his official reports amply testify. The same mental poise which inspired the unparalleled audacity of his campaigns gave him the strength to bear, and to bear alone and unflinching, even through the closing scenes of the surrender, the burden of his great responsibility. Surely there never lived a man who could more truly say, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul.